trigger warning. This episode contains multiple references to shamanism and the soul. Those of a nervous disposition may prefer to turn off and watch repeats of Top Gear instead. There is this moment when you go into the dark, when you take on this ritual time, this ritual space. You know, whenever I perform, I come off the stage and then a day or two later, I've got bruises all over my legs that I don't remember being in any pain or feeling anything. I'm in another world. For the audience, time stops and there's this moment of connection and reflection and a collective catharsis if you're doing a good show. I think I was alert enough as a child to know that, you know, this was a man dressing up performing a character but I bought into that character and I've always loved pop stars who will be more flamboyant you know be something apart from a normal human being. As the lights dim and performers take to the stage or screen is it simply escapism or is there something more timeless and profound about our need to be entertained? Why do we get so fanatical and idolatrous about pop stars, actors, comedians and performers, especially when we're young, often wanting them to be something more than us mere mortals. Might the whole entertainment industry have learnt its trade from a magical three-tiered realm of gods, mortals and spirits, taking us on a shamanic journey of the soul known to some as the Death and Resurrection Show? Let's find out. Sitting comfortably? Seatbelts on? We're off on another adventure in Utopia with me, David Brown. This podcast is sponsored by the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. No, really. Space dust, anybody? It's out of this world. Far out! Space dust, available in outer space. When David Bowie appeared on Top of the Pops in 1972, dressed in a colourful cat suit, dyed red hair and stick-thin body, singing Starman, countless teenagers stared in awe at their TV screens, wondering if Bowie himself was from another world. At the peak of his powers, Bowie ignited fanatical devotion. He was different from the rest of us, a one-off, a deviant and misfit, with different coloured eyes and an ever-changing wardrobe of gender-bending attire. And while Bowie wasn't really an alien from outer space, he was actually from Bromley, he was one of our greatest rock and roll stars. When we mourned his passing in 2016, it was for something far more than just his songs. We do these things that are exotic. What, you know, I'm covered in dragon tattoos. I'm Jewish. Why do I want to be exotic? Why do I want to be other? You know, and I've covered myself in these monsters all over my body. Why? You know, the showgirl, the showwoman, she is other, she's exotic, she is... Is that because it's an orientalist fantasy of sexuality and it's exciting? Or is it a deep desire for something ritualised, some kind of liminal state, some kind of transcendent experience? Probably a bit of both. Performer Marissa Karneski there, who we'll meet properly later in this episode. A few years ago, I took a pilgrimage to Liverpool to meet Rogan Taylor, the author of The Death and Resurrection Show, a book which anyone who knows me will know that I've long obsessed over and whose content forms the backbone of all of the ideas in this episode. Written in 1985, its premise is that everything we think of as showbiz and entertainment are the offspring, as Rogan puts it, of the shaman shows of our nomadic ancestors. Circus Big Top, theatre, live comedy, music, magic, panto, TV, film, box sets, all owe their trade to the performances of our shamanic ancestors in the darkened yurt. It took some time to track Rogan down, and even longer persuading him to be interviewed. After all, since writing The Death and Resurrection Show nearly 40 years ago, Rogan had turned his attention solely to football, writing countless books on the subject and pioneering the world's first postgraduate football degree. Thankfully, an interview was granted. Now, it needs to be said that the word shaman is going to crop up a lot over the next hour. This word is specific to particular indigenous people of Northern Europe and Siberia, yet tends to be used willy-nilly to describe all indigenous cultures with the medicine person at the heart of the community. And while Carl Jung's term, the wounded healer, is perhaps a better phrase, we will be using the term shaman throughout, partly because we're drawing directly from Rogan's work, and also because the interplay of the words showman, shaman, and Bowie's starman 
is just too good to miss. Along the way, we'll pay a visit to the Panto and a Mummer's Play. We'll explore the work of Nick Cave and others, meet performers Marissa Karneski and magician Paul Zenon. But first, let's meet Rogan and learn a bit of his incredible life story. It was recorded in a noisy office space, so apologies for the whirring laptop fan. He's also a little bit sweary at times, but then he is a scouser after all. My life has been, in, a, in the sort of typical sense, uh, arse about face. I retired when I left school at 16 um, and went on a sort of uh, world tour for you know about 15, 20 years now, nearly. And then I went to university in my mid thirties. You know, my 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 mom stuck me in the army. Well, and I thought I was sort of signing up for an outward bound course. You know. <laughs> And in October 1962, with the strains of Love Me Do, you know, ringing through the corridors of this horrible little camp in Tom Van Allen, North Wales. And so I went into the, uh, the commanding officer and said, um, listen, there's been a mistake. I, I, I'm off, you know, I'm, I'm going back to Liverpool. I'll, I'll see you later. And he said, no, you're not, you know. And I said, well, actually, I am. And then that night I went over the wall and I was gone. And that was my first AWOL. And kept on getting bus because I was a kid, I was 16. Coppers wouldn't walk past that, you know. And I'd be, you know, back and... So 16-year-old Rogan keeps escaping from the army and after a year they washed their hands of him. I remember walking through those gates, you know, with me, my bag on my back and thinking, I am free, free. He gets a ferry to Scandinavia, moves around Europe, hitchhikes to India, Afghanistan, Baghdad. He lives in the Himalayas for a few years, goes to Australia, Bengal, Assam, Bhutan, Indonesia, living a nomadic lifestyle and spending much of his time with people who have lived like this for thousands of years. These are formative experiences. Afghanistan with just, a, you know, a horseback tear in through her ass, you know, looking like Jimi Hendrix's, you know, with jewellery and black hair and beers, sexiest man I've ever seen in my life, you know. This is it. Can I do this forever, God? This is better than anything I could have imagined. That was my shamanistic nomadic experience. You know, that was the kicker. In his mid-thirties, Rogan returns home and finds a degree that allows him to specialise in studying, as he puts it, the religion of the travelling people. Because that's where religion comes from. And as we were all travelling for a million years, before 8,000 years ago, somebody decided to build a stone house and a fucking chair. That's all we did, right? Place to place. And how is knowledge carried in a non-literate society? It's in the songs and the poems, isn't it? It's in the and the heads yeah. of those men and women who are capable of carrying it. This leads to an MA in the front page of the Sunday Times magazine, with an article suggesting that the figure of Santa Claus is derived from psychedelic shamanistic cults that drank reindeer piss, infused with the psychotropic chemicals of the red and white fly agaric mushroom, hence the flying reindeer. When a book deal is offered, Rogan abandons the PhD he's working on and writes up his research as a book instead the death and resurrection show. How would he sum it up? Effectively, I say, shamanism is showbiz. What's showbiz? Why is it the great tent that everybody goes to whenever they turn on the radio or get in the car or stick on the iPhone, right? Everybody's on, everybody takes part. In. Showbiz is the religion of the world. Why do they go into the tent of showbiz? They go in there to feel better. And that's what show, that's the holy tent of showbiz. Entertainment. I mean, what does that word mean? Well, it's two words. It's enter, inter in Latin, which means between. Inter and tain. It's that which holds us together. Religion. It's two words. Re and ligio. Ligio is rope, ligament. Religio is to bind fast all tied together. Religion. It's that which holds us together. The words fucking tell you everything you really need to know. The way you've described the, the, the shaman character throughout, I'd probably use the term showman. You know, it's, it's basically, it's an entertainer, but it's more than an entertainer. It's someone who's got some gravitas, some presence. 
while you're saying that, I think the, uh, the word celebrity sprung to mind because obviously the origins of that are star, you know, star like. Yeah. And um, before show business was a, a thing, then the celebrity would have been the shaman, I suppose, you know, yeah. that character. So the fact that it comes from the stars is, is kind of quite apt, I think, isn't yeah. it? Magician Paul Zenon there, who we'll meet properly later. So, in the Death and Resurrection show, Rogan presents the idea of the shaman as someone who delivers a performance, a show, to the community in a darkened yurt, and this was integral to nomadic societies, and still important now. Likely candidates for the role of shaman in traditional communities might be those we'd now identify as misfits, neurodiverse, those suffering recurring illnesses, those displaying antisocial behaviour, or those just found skulking in their yurts playing Joy Division on repeat. Nowadays, they'd be more likely to form a band, turn to art, theatre, stand-up comedy, poetry, and in extreme cases be medicated or locked up. But in shamanic societies, they'd be singled out to undertake training from an established healer in the hope that they could first cure themselves. They must, in Rogan's words, retrieve their own soul from the underworld and demonstrate mastery over the forces which, uncontrolled, create sickness. In penetrating the underworld, they return equipped with the power to help the community, to heal sickness, individual and collective. Only in healing their own sickness would a trainee shaman be able to truly help others with theirs. When ready, they'd be required through drugs, fasting, dancing, etc. to break on through to the other side, to the spirit realm of the underworld and undergo a great voyage. In the underworld that experience many types of sickness and disease, appease or do battle with spirits until finally, inevitably, they are dismembered and die. But with the help of spirits, reborn anew, put back together again, remembered, healed. From here, the shaman travels to the upper realm of the gods and finally returns to our middle world bestowed with the necessary skills, gifts and powers to be a healer. But how to prove such a transformation to the community? Literally getting their act together, putting on a show, to share their unique adventures in the underworld and upper world, to stage a death and resurrection show. It's a narrative very familiar to us. The misfit dreamer, outsider, who descends into an underworld and ascends to an upper world and undergoes adventures and transformation. It's there in Aladdin, Jonah and the Whale, The Resurrection of Christ, Jack and the Beanstalk, Star Wars, Ishtar and Inanna. It is in the adventures of the time-travelling, monster-battling, regenerating magician shaman known as Doctor Who. It is of course the story of Orpheus, though this myth reminds us that sometimes these adventures end in failure. In staging the retelling of their own death and resurrection adventures, the shaman wouldn't just deliver a monologue to the community, but also demonstrate a particular skill or craft to wow the audience. These might include any of the following. Magic, illusion, comedy, feats of memory, music, dance, circus skills, theater, ventriloquism, wordplay, humor. In judging the shaman's ability, audiences wouldn't be discriminating between fact and fiction, but as with our own experiences of live performance, more a question of how skilled, how compelling, how moving, how original did we lose ourselves? Was it a good show? Amongst their many roles in a society, the shaman could be thought of as the fine tuner of the psyche of the community, the keeper of its soul, the unacknowledged role now of our heroes of stage and screen. Marissa Karneski is a contemporary performer whose shows mix performance art, experimental theater, traditional circus skills, magic and illusion. She perceives a direct connection between live performance and a shaman-like magic ritual. Her 2020 show, The Incredible Bleeding Woman, mixed all of these whilst exploring the concept of menstrual magic. I have this drive to put shows on, you know, organising shows for charity when I was a, even a child. So I was always putting on a show. So I've just carried on putting on a show my whole life and I'm now 51 and I'm still putting on shows. <laughs> you know, I used to think it was just because I was a show off, you know, maybe I was an exhibitionist, I wanted to be looked at, but it's more than that. It's, um, it's a different connection, it's, a diff it's an elevated sense of consciousness and it's a connection with the audience and when it works and when it really happens 
and you have the audience and you've done material that speaks to people and gives them catharsis and they are crying and they are laughing and then they're standing up. For me, doing that with spectacle and skills, clever monologues, I also want to add extraordinary sucker skills and magic illusions and I work with fairground devices good old traditional stage and audience, you know. <laughs> I've tried the show many ways, but there is something really important about the stage and the audience. It's important for the audience and it's important for the artists. It's, it's a ritual. There is this um, moment where you are in a theatre where you're watching this kind of performance, especially if you're looking at performers that can do extraordinary things, performers who can defy gravity or um, defy pain. It's this moment for the audience and for the performer when we can transcend the everyday. I used to go to synagogues when I was a child and I used to be in this, you know, little suburban witchcraft coven <laughs> um, and it was quite hard to believe it in a way. It was quite hard to engage. It was quite hard to really transcend the everyday. For me, the closest I get, I have to say, when I, lo when I lose a sense of self and I become kind of completely immersed in a a ritual state is when I'm performing and I'm in it in that moment and I've got the lights on me and that's more of a, a kind of experience of transcending the everyday and getting into a ritual state than I've managed to achieve in a kind of religious setup and you know I think our shows are a magic spell you know in a way they and and people who are practicing um practitioners of wicca and paganism that i know they say oh your show is a ritual it is a magic spell not everyone responds to the call like marissa british prime minister john major actually ran away from the circus to become an accountant then a tory mp and then prime minister which probably tells you all you need to know about accountants and politicians but i digress so what happened to atomize the shaman's skills into the myriad forms of live entertainment, circus, music, comedy, that we think of it now? When the three great agricultures develop in you know, Mesopotamia, India and China, almost simultaneously, you know, about five, six thousand years ago, maybe better. And when you think about them, how can they expand? Because the thing about them is they overproduce food. Right, and once you overproduce food, you can have a standing army because everyone doesn't have to be out picking berries and chasing fucking wild deer all day, right? Because you've got more food than you need, so you can have priesthoods, you can have a, a religion. Those who are, are still traveling keep moving further and further north. If you decided that you don't want to do a deal and join the static culture, and in the end, of course, many of them have to. So that's the point where you're sitting down thinking, how the fuck can we do what we do in a culture where everybody lives in a stone house and doesn't move around? As new societies evolved and different power structures of monotheism, empire and priesthoods came into play, shamans found their status being eroded. The underworld, once a place of healing, transformation and magic, was denigrated into the idea of hell, a place of eternal torment. Shamanism effectively fell out of favour. The solution was either to conform or take the show on the road. A master of disguise, the shaman show underwent its own death and resurrection, manifesting in early forms from travelling Greek theatre to the medieval mummers plays to the travelling medicine shows that toured around Europe and America, led by an extrovert figure of the doctor employing theatre and persuasive language to peddle snake oil. Here were the tricks and skills of shamanism in yet another guise. The shaman show manifested into pantomime, music hall, great magic and illusion shows, cabaret, and of course, circus, with its master of ceremonies and myriad acts, proffering many of the skills associated with the shaman show. Paul Zenon is a professional magician who found his calling from a very young age. I ask him where he thinks magic shows originated and about the associations that we have between travelling cultures and magic. So I've kind of been a full-time entertainer for about 40 years now, I think. I've been doing it since I was a kid. Uh, so I've always kind of combined the two, the comedy and magic. I've never been sort of a, um, 
want to play the outright wizard who has supernatural powers, you know, which is probably where where magic started out at. Yeah, I think you know within my field, it's kind of using uh, using deception for good, basically. You know, you're uh, using it to entertain people. I asked Paul how far we can trace this back. We've no, really no idea how far it goes back. We know it's at least a few hundred years. Um, my kind of theory on it was that it was more likely to be um, someone doing a sli simple sleight of hand thing to make a pebble or a seashell appear or disappear just as a, uh, a demonstration of their powers as a shaman. A shaman would uh, increase his hold on an audience by doing a physical demonstration, you know, so even though his power probably lay in something more cerebral, uh, a physical demonstration would hold, hold more sway with people, you know, and so he would quite likely use deception for that and not tell them that it was a magic trick. So the idea that um, you know, the, the entertainer as the, as the outsider as well is, is a, a big theme. I mean, it's, it's only really since, I'm guessing, middle of the 19th century that entertainers have had any sort of respectability whatsoever, you know. Um, you, you were the strolling vagabonds, and, um, and some of us still are. But I think you're right about the, the idea that they somehow have magical powers of some sort, you know, the, whether it's reading your tea leaves or your palm and that, that kind of thing, or putting a curse on you. Uh, I think a lot of people still believe in that kind of thing. Performers like Paul clearly relate to the idea that the magician's performance may have its roots in shamanism. So what about circus? Can we find the narrative of the death and resurrection show there? Journeys in the underworld and upper world? The death and resurrection show is all around, Rogan keeps reminding us. And he argues that we might think of the ringmaster or mistress as the shaman, the clowns representing the chaos and mischievous spirits of the underworld, the lion tamer, strongman, horseback riders, demonstrating a shamanic mastery over pain and power over the animal kingdom, and the aerialists as the flight to the upper world. Marissa too sees evidence of such shamanic ritual and narrative, both in circus and her own show, The Incredible Bleeding Woman, which explores themes of menstrual magic. In Orthodox Judaism, when I was a child, there wasn't a pulpit at the back of the temple. It was in the middle. So we were all at the top in the round. It's kind of a horseshoe, like the circus is a, is a horseshoe. So I think there's something very temple-like about the circus and about being in the round. But when, you know, you think of a kind of a healing show or a medicine show in kind of old American carnival or travelling side shows. It's very much, it's a tented show. People come and they do something that is about healing or medicine. But in just kind of coming into contemporary circus, that's still that tradition of using the kind of the horseshoe shape and then the focal points being really earthy with the clowns. And then there's the use of the air right above you where you've got your aerialists really defying gravity. So you're taken through these different stages obviously especially if you're using things like magic and you've got smoke and appearances and disappearances there's something so ceremonial traditional circus always has a certain amount of acts and the acts are always in a certain order the aerialists come at a certain point the clowns come at a certain point if there's an animal act as there used to be in britain they would come at a certain point in the and there was a tradition and a rigor that was similar to a religious ceremony. You know, in, in the Bleeding Woman show, for instance, we do lots of magic and skills and we lots of comedy and then we drop on them. You know, there's an aspect of all of us telling a part of our real stories and some of them are about loss and miscarriage. And it is a kind of a, a, a flight between the different worlds because, you know, the comedy is really earthy and it's a real belly laugh and it really connects us to the absurdity of the everyday. And you know, the whole idea of the clown is the clown fails, the clown has shame, and that's why we love the clown, that's why we have catharsis. But then if you're depicting this kind of high priestess, burlesque queen, wearing very little or nothing or something very ornate, and you're very untouchable and other and like a dream and 
then we go from one state to the other. So we, uh, so we've got our feet in the underworld, in the comedy, in the roots, exploring the shame. You know, we become our singing, all dancing, flying witches at the end. You know, there's this this middle spot, this sweet spot where we're really talking directly to the audience about our experiences and getting them to really identify. So they they laugh, then they have catharsis, then they're dazzled. You know. We might end with a joke or two. We might come back down. If there's one time of year when we really lean into the shaman show's cornucopia of performance, magic, spirits, soul retrieval and death and resurrection, it's Christmas. And the story that really rebooted this festive season, in the UK at least, A Christmas Carol, is the journey of Scrooge's shaman-like descent into the underworld, in search of his lost soul, with the help of three spirits. If Christmas Carol is our favourite Christmas tale, everyone's favourite feel-good Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is a celluloid magical soul retrieval journey into the underworld. George Bailey, played to perfection by James Stewart, lives a life of thwarted dreams and financial problems to the point where he considers taking his own life until a spirit guide an angel called Clarence, descends from the heavens and acts as George Bailey's guide down into a dystopian version of his hometown Bedford Falls and one in which he has never been born. What else are you? What are you... You a hypnotist? No, of course not. Well, then why am I seeing all these strange things? Don't you understand, George? You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. Thanks to his jaunt through the underworld, George sees how much better the lives of those around him have been because of him, and he's born again, resurrected, remembered. And he returns to his own world healed, a wiser, kinder, joyful soul. And in following George's own death and resurrection every Christmas, we too feel better at the end. And perhaps more sanguine towards those more difficult relatives that we find ourselves stuck with in the festive season. Films like It's a Wonderful Life are nourishment for the soul. Since medieval times, Mummer's plays have been performed over the Christmas period. Researching this episode in winter, I took a trip to Oxford on Boxing Day to see my first Mummer's play being performed across various pubs in the city. Can you identify the shaman in the story we're about to hear? And a tale of death and rebirth? Hello, I'm Dave Townsend, I'm the squire of Headington Quarry Morris Dancers, and this is Boxing Day, and we're doing uh, our usual rounds on Boxing Day of the Headington Quarry pubs, and we do this performance of the Mama's Play, and some rapper sword dancing, hand bell ringing. And it's um, the, the story of, uh, of King George, and he fights an adversary. In our case, it's the Turkish knight. He gets killed. A doctor comes in and cures him and brings him back to in life. In comes I, King George, a man of courage bold. He is. I won 10,000 crowns of gold. He did. I <laughs> fought the fiery dragon and led it to its slaughter. By that means, I fairly claim the king of Egypt's daughter. Royally so. Here comes I! Thing, I think from our point of view is the old story of St George is about his martyrdom and he was killed apparently on a Monday so you know one day he gets chopped to pieces and then blow me next morning he'd come back to life villagers would have been familiar with these people who came into the village and offered to cure anything under the sun selling all sorts of quack remedies if the devil's in him I'll fetch it out a touch to the heart a touch to the knee. Oh. Rise up, King George, and follow me. Oh. You know, I'm coming in sort of from outside, a bit of an outsider. You know, he doesn't 
totally belong in the village. There's a bit of a thing in Mummers to go from one village to another, especially in Oxfordshire. They'd visit other places. The, a lot of the appeal of this kind of thing is, is that it's something that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Sitting quietly in a pub and suddenly this bunch of lunatics rush in and start shouting at you. You know, that's, I, th- I think we like that sort of thing to happen. You know. It's worth noting that all the players were dressed up. The Doctor wore a Max Wall wig, a bow tie, and a suitcase with Doctor Who written on it, and filled with a rubber chicken, false hand, stethoscope, and a giant hip flask. It was the mysterious snake oil or whiskey or whatever was in the hip flask that finally brought George back from the dead. There again was the shaman, in a role that referenced clown, healer, snake oil seller magician, and in a rather brief but entertaining narrative of death and resurrection, performed by travelling players. And finally, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas, in the UK at least, without the time-honoured tradition of the panto. And yes, it's there too. Jack and the Beanstalk and Aladdin are both stories of misfits, dreamers, loners, identified by cosmic forces as shaman to be. Jack ascends to the upper world to fight giants. Aladdin descends to the underworld via a cave, where he is bestowed with princely powers. Then he ascends to the upper world via a magic carpet and triumphs over the evil, soul-sapping Abanazar. Going to the first pantomimes was an evening spent largely in hell, Taylor writes in the Death and Resurrection show. Having gone to see a brilliant rendition of Jack and the Beanstalk at nearby Rottingdean with my partner Anne, in search of evidence of the shamanic narrative, we had a deep and meaningful conversation about this when we got home. So did you enjoy the pantomime? Oh, no it doesn't. What? That, that doesn't even work. Oh, yes it does. Oh, no it doesn't. Ah, but that did. <laughs> yes, that did. Oh, no it didn't. Oh, shut up. Where's my phone gone? Hey, Anne. It's behind you. Ow, ow, that hurt. Oh, no, it didn't. Stupid tape here. In the first half of this episode, we've looked for evidence of the death and resurrection show in myriad forms of performance, including magic shows, mummers' plays, circus, pantomime and theatre. But what of those performers who embody the shaman themselves? Taylor tells us that the wounded healer archetype can be found across time in in characters both fictional and real. Over the last few hundred years, the shaman has manifested in Shakespeare's Prospero, in Harlequin, Joey Grimaldi, Charlie Chaplin and Houdini. Here's Paul Zenon again. Houdini really was kind of the, the first superhero, you know, he was, uh, bearing in mind that kind of superhero comics started around the same time he did, he, he became the sort of living embodiment of the, of the Superman, you know, definitely, you know, representative of, of that sort of shaman type, type character in general, you know, he's, um, he, he really did feel like he was superhuman. Closer to our hearts, perhaps, the shaman can be found in the guise of the comedian, the lovable wounded healer whose role is to act as a siphon for our collective psyche, that we may exercise our own sickness through them, through laughter. It is, after all, the best medicine. I was cleaning up the attic last week, and I found this old violin and this painting. I took them to a, an expert, and he said to me, what you've got there, he said, you've got a Stradivarius and a Rembrandt. Unfortunately, Stradivarius <coughs> was a terrible painter. <laughs> and Rembrandt... <laughs> Tommy Cooper there, who began his stage career as a very young magician, and a pretty lousy one at that. Cooper was traumatised and badly hurt by audience laughter when his tricks kept going wrong. He could have given up, but instead underwent a form of death and resurrection when he realised he could turn this into an act and became a chaotic clown instead. Through his humour, Cooper took audiences to the underworld. He was a conduit for our failures and disasters. But being an excellent showman, he could dazzle and surprise them too with a magic trick. Provided it went right, of course. We first met Head Druid of Anglesey Chris Hughes in Series 1 discussing ritual. 
In early childhood, Chris suffered trauma through the dead bodies that he was exposed to in his daily life as an autopsy technologist, creating conditions for a necessary transformation in Chris. One that, as we'll learn, taps into the idea about the healing nature of performance for both audience and performer. Before Chris, here's Marissa with a similar story of her own. Before I was a real doctor, PhD doctor, I created the character Dr Karneski. And um, she was a kind of funny anthropologist in a kind of 60s giallo horror style with a funny dress that comes apart. And um, this lady that I created, which was a version of myself, which was the character Dr Karneski, which was a kind of horror movie Dr Karneski lecturer, was in this show and it was during this period of my life that I had you know pregnancy loss and miscarriage and I got divorced and it was all awful but I had this lady that I'd created this kind of high priestess lecturer lady that kind of carried me through which was just me being another version of myself on stage but she had been my this identity I created this persona Um, this ritual state of myself was maybe the auntie I needed to get me through this terrible time. And so she delivered me out of that time, but then I knew that she was going to bed. Um, So that's, you know, if I face difficulties in my life or a conflict or a question I can't answer, I make a show and it gets me through. The the drag was was a response and it was a response to an emotional turmoil that was happening inside me. And I found myself as a very young man in, in an environment where I was faced with the horror of, of death and grief and, and the having to deal with it and suddenly realising that I have to somehow process this now or I'm going to lose my shit. So how do I process that? I found that comedy was what did it for me. So when people come to a Maggie Noggy show, they can forget that parts of their lives are, you know, have turned to shit that day. Mm. They can just forget for an hour and laugh. And I find that, to me, laughter is an exceptionally pure form of medicine. So I love that comedy is not only something that enables my anxiety be transformed into joy and other people's anxieties to turn into joy. But I think, you know, anybody in my mind who puts on a pair of heels, some fake tits and a wig is a hero in my mind because I know how difficult it is to do that and that there is an element of the sacred in it. But it's more than just a man who's dressed as a woman. It is significantly more than that. In, In the process, in the transformation... Um, it takes about three hours for me to transform into Maggie, you know, because I'm I'm a six foot three strapping big man, and I turn into a seven foot six <laughs> Amazonian, you know, and she is genuinely seven foot six. It's obviously not a woman <laughs> on that stage, but it is. It's definitely an archetype. Mm. She is an archetype, and I play on that as well because her name is Maggie Noggy, which is a play on words. So it comes from Mabinogi, which mm. is the Welsh corpus of mythology, because she's a mythological being. It's it's that c- comedy formula, you know, that the first five minutes you hit them really fast with every single pun that you've got and you pull them in, you know, and then you slow it down and then you go into your stories that are punctuated with one liners or, or um, you know, punchlines. And but at the 40 minute mark, that's where you go dark. Even in comedy, you know, the best comedy will always have a darkness at the 40 minute mark where you get them to feel something that they weren't expecting to feel. And then you ramp it back up again and hit them with everything that you've got for the last you know, 10 minutes. And, um, and it's that 40 minute mark that I love the most. It's that profundity that they just didn't expect. Out of a crisis, Marissa and Chris created alter egos for themselves as a comedy doctor and a drag queen. The way Chris describes the unfolding of his comedy routine mirrors the narrative arc of The Shaman Show. We get the descent into the underworld, the journey, the stories. Then that 40 minutes mark where, in Chris's words, he goes dark. That's the death and dismemberment. The last 10 minutes, throwing everything you can at the audience, this is the resurrection, the ascent and return and everyone goes home happier, having had a spot of laughter therapy from a wounded healer. It's interesting, when you watch TV at home, if I watch comedy on a screen, um, I don't tend to laugh out loud if I'm on my own. 
Uh, whereas if I'm in a theatre or a comedy club or whatever, I do. And it's because you want to connect with the people next to you. Even if you don't know them and you sat in the dark, um, it's letting them know that w what you think is funny or what you react to. And you know, that's where applause comes from, you know. And you just don't get that over... Um, uh, doing it over a, a screen. But I suppose you could say the same about um, plays that are about difficult subjects, you know, yeah. um, go and see something, you know, play about Myra Hindley killing children, you know, you're not going there for a laugh, um, but there's something about being part of an audience. An audience is, a, is an organism, you know, it's a, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, basically. And it's all about being in the same shared space, and you just don't get that through a screen. <laughs> When we were kids or teenagers, how many of us had someone that we idolised? Some kind of performer, rock star, comedian or actor? Someone superhuman or that we projected onto as being superhuman? For Jude Rogers, music journalist and author of The Sound of Being Human, one of the magical figures in her childhood was pop star Adamant. Having lost her father when only five, those early years of her life were tough for both Jude and her mother. In her book she wrote, I'd like Adam to know that he alerted a sad anxious child to be in the best place from which the rest of her childhood could grow. Adam Ant, formerly Stuart Goddard, had an even tougher upbringing. His father in prison, Stuart grew up on a council estate with his mum and began to suffer mental health problems, which in his late teens led to a nervous breakdown. It was after the breakdown that, in his own words, he decided to kill off his former self and re-emerge as adamant. Again, it's hard not to read a death and rebirth narrative in Goddard's transformation into his own heroic alter ego and how that had such an impact on people like Jude. Well, I remember seeing the video to Prince Charming, but there was something about just the, him as... The Prince Charming figure, you know, he looked like the kind of figures that were, you know, I'd see in front of children's storybooks, just, you know, painted or, you know, whatever. Um, and ridicule is nothing to be scared of, sticking in my head. Um, I didn't really know what that meant um, kind of fully, but, you know, I knew he was rebellious and there was something about him that I really clung to. And I remember really enjoying dressing up there when I was a little kid. And uh, I think I became aware of his difficult early life when there was the incident in Camden when he was waving a gun around at a bar and you know he and there was reported widely in the tabloids you know, he had a very tough upbringing you know he'd had this real breakdown when he just went to art college this is when he decided to yeah kill Stuart Goddard and become adamant and this is kind of 76-ish 77-ish you know finding all that I was an adult it did strengthen my attachment to this connection with him as a child he just fueled my imagination in these amazing ways um and um I think all pop music does that in various ways to you when you're a kid I think I was alert enough as a child to know that you know this was a man dressing up performing a character but I bought into that character and I've always loved pop stars who will be more flamboyant, you know, be something apart from a normal human being. Oh, I'm David Bowie, I live down the road. Over the last 70 years, key individuals from the world of music have been incredibly powerful conduits for our suffering and our joys. It was Bowie who uniquely mixed theatre, mime and costume in his shows, fueled himself with drugs, dabbled with black magic and cross-dressing, and looked like he came from outer space. He was one of our greatest rock and roll stars, a chameleon who undertook countless journeys of death and resurrection through his many incarnations and alter egos. Bowie was the alien who united the alienated. All the young dudes, the teenage loners and lost souls, with his rallying cry of, Give me your hand, you're not alone. In mourning his death in 2016, with the intensity that so many did, it wasn't just a talented musician we lost, but in Rogan's words, a great upper world shaman. And isn't that, isn't that great? You know, I mean, Bowie and Hendrix are beautiful examples yeah. of upper world and underworld. Yeah. Shamans, aren't they? You know, one's all slippy and fiery and sexy, and the other's 
androgynous yeah and about flight and air all the songs it's all you know ground control to major yeah. tone isn't it it's all you know dialogue between the upper world and the middle world in the death and resurrection show Rogan also reports that during their second tour of the US, the Beatles began to find audience members loitering backstage with sick relatives and friends in the hope of being touched by members of the band and therefore healed. It's all crazy. We're just four lads from Liverpool who write songs, Lennon reportedly grumbled in a strangely poor Scouse accent. Being a Scouser, of course, Taylor was a Beatles fan, and of the four, he identified Lennon as the one marked out as the wounded healer. Lennon's upbringing was, after all, full of instability and loss. He was a troubled soul. In 1964, he penned both I'm a Loser and Help, frank expressions of a vulnerability that none of his bandmates or peers came close to. Of the four, it was Lennon who expressed his own mystical experiences on LSD so profoundly through such phenomenal songs as Tomorrow Never Knows and Strawberry Fields. While McCartney has always felt more comfortable presenting himself as an everyman, one of us, it was Lennon who appeared bollock naked on his first solo album cover. Lennon who was the go-to guy for would-be revolutionaries. Lennon who stayed in bed for peace and climbed inside a bag as a satire on prejudice. It was Lennon whose second album, Two Virgins, was a primal scream outpouring of anger and pain. It was Lennon who co-created the idea of Newtopia with Yoko. And it was Lennon, more than the others, that fans turned to, to express and heal their own suffering. And, you know, I was in the cavern in 1962. Whew. You know, what a privilege, hey? Mm. And, you know, you get, if you're lucky, those moments when you see greatness, you know. Like Lennon, he can take you down to strawberry fields where nothing is fucking real and you haven't got the foggiest about what's going on. But he can also take you across the universe where there's limitless, undying love that shines around you. While Lennon had the rare ability to straddle all three realms as a shaman-like performer, some artists do appear to fit into the categories of lower, upper or middle world pretty neatly. It's probably worth adding a bit of clarity here that the three tiers of lower, middle and upper world relate in a generalised way to different types of art and performance. The kind of person who really loves metal and horror films is drawn to the realms of the underworld. Fans of the films of Wes Anderson prefer having their heads in the clouds. I thought it might be fun to briefly explore our relationship with these three realms in relation to our musical heroes. And to accommodate listeners of all ages and different cultures, I've tried to choose examples that I hope will be known to most of us, in the West at least. For a middle world shaman, look no further than Adele. She doesn't wear dresses made of meat or swans or feel the need to make a concept album about magical ballet shoes. Adele is loved by her audience because she's relatable. She's one of us. Ten reasons why we adore Adele, writes Commuter.org, include her humility, her body positivity and her cheeky sense of humour. The same could not be said of the likes of Björk, Lady Gaga or Kate Bush. It's hard to imagine them shopping for cat food or having a meeting with their accountants. Like Marissa's untouchable high priestesses of burlesque and circus, these women are upper world shaman, inhabiting the realm of the gods. Think of Björk's otherworldly voice, her music and her image, Lady Gaga's outlandish attire, Kate Bush's highly conceptual albums. These women are not like us mere mortals, but like Bowie, they floated down from the stars. As did jazz maestro Sun Ra, who dressed like an Egyptian god and even liked to tell journalists that he was an angel from Saturn. In the underworld, we might encounter Amy Winehouse, Amanda Palmer, hear the guttural screams of Diamandi Gallas, the liver-rattling sounds of motorhead or swans, or enjoy the carnivalesque lascivious bump and grind of the sex pistols singing frigging in the rigging. 
And there, skulking in the corner, fag and whiskey in hand, Tom Waits. In 1976, Tom Waits moved into the Tropicana Motel, an unsanitary sleazy dump in downtown LA. A night owl and barfly, Waits deliberately chose to hunker down there, in the underworld, where, in his words, he could write the poetry of LA nightlife. Waits also got stuck in the underworld, as many of our rock gods do, and credits his wife for pulling him out, for saving him from some pretty serious addictions. Waits eventually left LA for a healthier lifestyle in New York. Rogan reminds us that in traditional shamanic cultures, the wounded healer was first required to heal themselves. Nowadays, we lean into anyone who'll take us on a journey to the upper or lower realms. Even if, like Kurt Cobain, Elvis, Amy Winehouse, they are, sadly, ill-prepared for such an arduous journey themselves, unable to return healed to the middle realm. With that in mind, a powerful example of a wounded healer today can be found in the musician Nick Cave. Cave burst onto the music scene in the mid-80s with his band The Birthday Party. A scrawny, sulky, self-obsessed goth with a junk habit, Cave snarled, growled and screamed over underworld music that rattled and shook. He really wasn't someone you'd trust to water your plants and feed your dog while you were away for the weekend. By middle age, Cave had remarried, kicked his heroin addiction and his focus had started to shift. Albums like Push the Sky Away revealed the growing vulnerability of a man in his 50s wrestling with his libido, his vanity and his loss of youth, and a man who must, as he puts it with his trademark dark humour in his lyrics, do husband alertness course. Then in 2015, he lost his 15-year-old son in a tragic accident. Cave, who had been trawling the underworld for much of his life for inspiration, was pulled back there through serious grief and dislocation and returned to the middle world, this time with a strong desire to connect with the suffering of others. Albums and films that followed explored themes of grief and loss. His live shows, already revered by fans, came even closer to what many described as a cathartic or even religious experience. Then in 2018, Cave began communicating with fans via a weekly mail-out, The Red Hand File. Along with questions about his creativity, plans and tours, fans also openly wrote of their own grief, anxieties, traumas and despair. Cave's responses are often thoughtful and profound. When one fan asks why music is important to him, Cave replies, Music helps release us from our suffering and points us towards the good. These songs have urgent work to do. I send them out into the world to travel where they're needed, to the joyful and the disheartened, the sick and the well, the grievers and those yet to grieve, the lost and the found, the good and the bad, and the somewhere in between. In another missive, when asked how he perceives himself, Cave even spells it out, writing, I'm in the job of saving souls. Cave has come to recognize his own shamanic, wounded healer role as performer and artist. Though like the magician giving away his tricks, I can't help sometimes wish that he wouldn't. At the heart of Rogan's book lies a profound question. Why did we become so obsessed with entertainment in the 20th and 21st century? Or, to put it another way, how did showbiz become the all-encompassing religion of our modern age? Nowadays, we have everything from Netflix and movies to gaming, VR, fantasy worlds, cosplay, box sets, pop idols. Live, we can see everything from Western musicals and stadium-filled concerts to band nights in our local pubs and touring theatre shows. After a hard day at work, it is often to soap operas, comedies and dramas on our screens that so many of us turn to for succour, comfort and escape. In the Death and Resurrection show, Rogan's response to the rise of all of this entertainment is a powerful one, writing, Showbiz has responded to our new sickness, our loss of soul to the rationality of science. It is the major therapeutic event of the modern age. Google the most soulless place on the planet, and the likes of Dubai often come up, places that many of us find to be 
too obsessed with material wealth and lacking any real culture. It tells us how much we value culture and entertainment and their role in our well-being. It reminds us too who the keepers of our collective soul are. For Taylor, there is one key myth that predicts our loss of soul and mental health crisis in the West. The core European myth is Faust. Um, that's why um, modern science and, and technology develops here first. You know, in the context of Faust, we, we, we sell our soul to the devil for knowledge. So heaven descends into the middle world in the shamanistic cosmology and the underworld ascends into the middle world. And all the stuff that used to be possible only in the imagination, like guys being dismembered and stuck back together again, oh, now we can do that in a hospital. You know, whether you're looking at an explosion of an atom bomb or a, you know, a child being born, you know, aged bloody... 20 weeks and surviving or a, you know, a dead man being brought back to fucking life again. Mm. You, you know, the death and resurrection show is all around you. Me and you and this fancy little machine and heat on tap and... And a hospital to go to if there's trouble, you know, for free. We can do the underworld tricks in the middle world. Mm. The upper world was character, we could go flying. Shit, you know, you go up, you can see God, you can wander around the planets, you, you know. It's all right, we can do that now as well, in the middle world. So we brought the two into the middle world, but we sold our soul for the knowledge. And the problem with, at the end, Faust is going to fucking hell, right? Our culture and the whole development of modern science and the utter debunking of religion and so on the collapse of religion in anything, you know, in mm. amongst modern Western people. The problem is this is all going to go off the end of a fucking cliff. If, if the myth comes first, you know, the myth's the truth, and then you live it. So we need new myths? Yeah, we do. In series one, we did explore the theme of new myths to live by. And there are plenty out there, emerging from powerful imaginations and that may serve in re-enchanting our lands and our hearts. And yet, for now, we remain on a precipice. Some may be pinning their hopes on the idea that technology, science, rationality will save us. But as Rogan says, the myth needs to come first. When the arts are under fire from funding cuts, when creative subjects are being limited in education, when only the affluent can afford the time to explore their creative visions, when venues are closing because of cuts and spiralling costs, it's worth considering what's at stake. Without a soul, Rogan writes, a culture can only survive for a short while, cruising on sheer momentum. It is the young who can diagnose this condition most immediately. It is their future at stake, after all. Dream Fisher and friend Kate Alderton, who we'll meet in a future episode, share with me a powerful quote. A nation without the arts is a nation that has stopped talking to itself and has stopped dreaming. The soul of society, she suggests, lies in our collective imagination. For Kate, the role of artist and performer, and for all of us, is to dream out loud. In researching this episode, I became acutely aware of how the dominance of patriarchy meant that many of the historical examples given skew towards the male. It is, however, heartening to see a new generation of otherworldly witchy shaman exploding across the arts, not least in music. Lone taxidermist, gazelle twin, bat for lashes, Billy No Mates, PJ Harvey, Anna von Hauswolf, Fever Ray, Grimes are just a few of the new dreamers and keepers of the soul of society. We may rely on screens and technology more than ever, but nothing can truly replace the magic of experiencing such artists in the darkened yurt, to be conduits for our suffering, to bring us succor, to provide nourishment for our lost and troubled souls. When in 1966, a young John Lennon said, the Beatles are bigger than Jesus, he too was recognizing that, as Rogan puts it, in the garden of religion, entertainment remains a hardy perennial. As the saying goes, the show must go on.
Adventures in Utopia was produced and presented by me, David Bramwell, with music from Oddfellows Casino. For more info, go to drbramwell.com or contact me on Twitter at drbramwell. Huge thanks to all of my guests in this episode and for the support of Hawkwood College. The idea of Newtopia was established by John and Yoko in 1973 as a place with no boundaries and whose international anthem is silence. Gratitude and support to our friends at Journey to Newtopia for their role in our provenance. This podcast is made possible by the generous sponsorship of Druids. What? You say? What, the award-winning international folk band from County Kildare? No. Oh, the 70s prog rock band from Birkenstead, who once appeared on the Old Grey Whistle Test. No. The contemporary Iowa-based metal band, whose albums include cycles of Mobium and Spirit Compass. No. Genuine druids. These are people from all walks of life, who have a shared love and respect for the natural world, and celebrate eight special festival times during the year. People who work to develop their creativity, to foster community and compassion and to study spiritual teachings that draw their inspirations from the natural world. People who are interested in meditation, mysticism and magic as means to improve their lives and the lives of others. People who are often engaged in projects to preserve, protect and restore the natural world and celebrate the creative arts. Do you get to wear cool robes and carry a staff? You can if you want, it isn't compulsory. Interested? Find out more at druidry.org.